Hello friends, welcome to SJ's classes. This is my second video lesson on Dr. K. Ayyappa Panikir and his poem Lay of the Anklet. In the previous video lesson, I spoke about Dr. K. Ayyappa Panikir, the poet, and I also gave you a glimpse into the summary of the poem Lay of the Anklet. I also elaborated to you the mythological story that forms the backdrop of the poem Lay of the Anklet. In this video lesson, I will give you my interpretations to the first part of the poem. Let's read the first stanza. Did fortune forsake you? Or was it you who forsook fortune? So as you can see, the poem begins with a question. Did fortune forsake you? Forsake you means did fortune leave you or abandon you? And the second line, the poet points out the other aspect of the question. Or was it you who forsook fortune? So with these questions, the poet tried to evoke the story of Kannagi in the mind of the readers. As you know, this poem is based on the mythological story of Kannagi, Kovalan and Madhavi. The Anglet story that has been recounted in the Tamil classic Chilapadigaram written by the saintly poet Ilangovadil. What Dr. K. Ayyappa Panikya has done with this poem or the story in this particular poem is that he tries to see Kannagi through the mirror of modern day aesthetics depicting Kannagi not as a deity but as the epitome of Indian womanhood and chastity. So with these questions she tries or the poet tries to evoke the story, the mythological story that forms the backdrop of this poem. Did fortune forsake you or was it you who, who forsook fortune? Why do you wake me up by rupturing my sleep with this age-old tale? So as readers, we are again confronted with yet another question. The poet asks the question, why do you wake me up? And the question that the readers face is, who is the poet addressing to? Who is the addressee in the poem? So the speaker, the poet asks, why do you wake me up by rupturing my sleep? Rapture means to stop abruptly, to stop something suddenly. So why do you wake me up in between my sleep? And why do you wake me up with this age-old tale, the tale of Kowal and Kannagi and Madhavi, the love triangle between these three characters? The castle gates are all barred, yet how did you enter? So the poet cannot stop himself from asking this question. All the gates and doors are barred. Now how did you enter? Again, it's not clear to us who the addressee is, whom the poet is addressing. Why do you still linger around, entwined like a fable, engraved on parchments? So the speaker repeats the question. Why do you still linger around? Linger around means lurk around or roam about here and there. And he makes a comparison there. Lurk, linger around, entwined like a fable engraved on parchments. And the person or whoever the poet addresses is compared to a fable engraved on parchments. A fable engraved on a paper, a piece of paper. Let's look at it like that way. Softened, cut up and bundle. So whoever the poet is addressing seems to the poet like a bundled up fable that has been engraved on a paper. Something that has been then there for a while. So why do you still linger around? Why do you still lurk around? Why are you rupturing my sleep? Again with this age old tale. 
So the poet is posing so many questions before us readers. Is it true? Are you the fateful tragic memory of the love story that went up in flames far away at renowned Madhurapuri? So it is in this stanza that we come to an understanding of who the addressee is. The speaker says, is it true? Are you the fateful tragic memory of the love story that went up in flames far away at renowned Madhurapuri? So it is in this stanza that we get some idea regarding the addressee or to whom the speaker talks. Now it is the memory of the tragic love story that went up in flames far away at renowned Madhurapuri. Again, the reference is to the memory, memories regarding the story of Kannagi, Kovalan and Madhavi, especially to, to Kannagi. All was lost, but you remained sheen intact. So everything was lost. The only thing that remains are memories regarding this particular event. And it remained intact. The tingle of an anglet throbs of the deity's presence in the new city. The sound of an anglet. The tinkle of an anglet means the sound of an anklet. And this sound of the anklet, you know, it brings us the presence of the deity. You know, as you, if you had watched my previous video lesson, then you might have understood that the story of uh, Kannagi ends with Kannagi crossing over to Kodunallur and becoming the deity there. So this anglet, the sound of the anglet fills us with the memories of this deity, of this character called Kannagi. Throbs of the deity's presence. Throbs means the pulsation of the heart. Here it should mean, it should stand as a symbol to the presence of the deity. Something that gives us the idea that this character is still alive. So even though we have all forgotten the story, even though they had given up their lives, they still they are still alive. The tingle of this anklet, the memories, all these give life to the story or these characters. This could be the old Dravidian ethos or the grief of Kovalan and Kannagi. So whatever that the poet is addressing, whatever that the poet, whatever that disturbed the poet's sleep, whatever that has entered into the poet's premise, you know, crossing all the barred gates, the poet imagines that it could either be the old Dravidian ethos the stories that is part of Dravidian culture, the original inhabitants of our country. Or it could also be the grief of Kovalan and Kannagi. It, co it could also be the story of how, you know, uh, how the, the tragic story of Kovalan and Kannagi. Or again, the wounded veins streaming out as the lore of the land. It could also be the memories of events that happened earlier. Or perhaps the unbroken history of Kundalanadu with its female rulers and the five Tines. And this is where Ayyappa Panikar peeps into the rich and fable history of Tamil culture. He talks about Kundalanadu and also Tines. Now, Tine is basically division of land. And there were five Tines in ancient Tamilagam. One is Kurinchi. It refers to the hilly or mountainous areas. Second is Mulle, grassland or forest land. The third is Pale, which refers to dry land or desert regions. Four is Mairudam, which is wetland or cropland. And the fifth one is Nadal, which corresponds to coastal or seashore regions. Now each Tinai corresponded to a poetical mode in Tamil poetics. So as I said earlier, this is a stanza wherein which Ayyapapanikya peeps into the rich history of Tamil culture. And the five Tinis, the apotheosis of a human being who knew inside out all the 32 Maypatus and their Agampuram acts. 
Meipat, Agampuram. Now all these are concepts in ancient Tamil poetics expounded in the treatise Tholpakyam. Tholpakyam is the most ancient surviving Tamil grammar text and oldest surviving work of Tamil literature. So whoever has disturbed the poet today, whatever that has come to the poet today, is, some, is someone or something that is rich with stories or memories. And what happened was the apotheosis of a human being who knew inside out all the 32 Maypatus and their Agampuram acts. So as the poet sees it or as the speaker sees it, what happened is the apotheosis of a human being. Apotheosis means the elevation of a person as to the status of a god. So this person was filled with knowledge and later on this person was elevated to the status of a god. You who resonate like a marble pillar towering the peaks of Sahya, who can be held within a single anglet, who throw with the glow of freshly spilled blood, what do I see when I look back at you? My family deity or a wonder not erased by history or the tidings of the present. The poet is full of wonder as he looks back at Karnagi. She seems to him like a marble pillar that towers above the Sahia mountain ranges. And as the poet looks back at her, he is not able to decipher whether she is a deity or a wonder or even a symbol of something that is happening in the present. Palaces burn, armies burn, offices burn. So the poet is recollecting the events uh, that led to the destruction of the renowned Madhirapuri. When Kannagi, she destroys the court and the city in the fire of her fury. Royal houses burn, burns the regal mansion. Regal mansion refers to the king's palace or king's mansion. Burns the regal mansion of the Pandya king. Burns the pride of the land. So everything was set ablaze by Kannagi. And that is how angry she was. That is how deep her grief was. Burns the glory of the land of the Tamils. Burns the ensign of the old culture. Ensigns means old emblems or signs. In the wrath of the bride dismembering herself. So as I narrated the story of Kannagi in the previous video lesson, I had said that you know when they shifted to Madurai, which was the capital city of Pandya kingdom, a misfortune overtakes them and Kovalan was arrested and brought before the king on the charges of stealing the queen's anglet. And the king executes Kovalan and uh, Kannagi was very unhappy, was very sad and very angry that she turns up at the royal court, now works herself up into a divine fury and tears away her breasts and throws up her anglet and destroys the court and city in the fire of her fury. So you have the imagery or picture of the event or the happening of Kannagi you know, tearing away her, away her breast. So that is what dismembering herself means in this particular verse. Dismember means to divide into pieces or to separate the body parts. So at different points you see the poet making reference to uh, Karnagi and that is why the mythological story forms you know like the spinal cord or the backbone of this poem. Time burns into the throes of the wounded heart. Again the reference is to Karnagi and how she you know, set ablaze the entire kingdom to take revenge on the action committed by the, the then king. In the burning tears of the weeping woman burns the spirit of the land. Leaving the burning city, the reference is to Madhurapuri, which was set ablaze by Karnagi. 
Leaving the burning city and as the dusk falls, possesses the restful feet to cross the hills along with the blowing winds to Kodungallu. So as I said earlier, the story narrates that after this, Kannagi, she came to Kodungallu and settled there as a deity. Along with the blowing winds to Kodungallu with trembling feet, there is a deity, a lamp in the sanctum, a hand to shelter all. So she settled down she settles down as a deity at Kodungallur and there is this sanctum. Sanctum means a sacred place that is a sort of a shelter for all. That thrives there amid woeful memories. So this particular sanctum thrives there, <coughs> survives there amidst woeful memories. <coughs> woeful means full of grief. So this particular sanctum, this sacred place where she rests or settled down as a deity, uh, survives at that particular place amidst you know, so much of grief and you know, unhappy memories. To give succour to those who nurse broken hearts. So the poet believes that the deity is there, the sanctum is there or a lamp has been lit in the sanctum. Now all these are there so as to give assistance to people in times of difficulty. To give succour means to give assistance, especially in times of difficulty. So this deity is there, this sanctum is there to give succour, to give assistance to people who nurse broken hearts, who take care of people with unhappy memories, to take care of people who have broken hearts. This is where part one of the poem ends. In the next video lesson, I will discuss part two. Thank you so much for watching.